the glory of man. Okay. Matthew 10, 32. Trying to focus and drive it home that we need to focus on glorifying God. Okay, keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Remember, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Verse 33, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Well, I'm going to stop there for a second just as some advice. Brothers and sisters Christ, there are times where people's words will say, I do not deny Jesus Christ, I believe in Jesus Christ. But in works they deny him. The Bible talks about that. Okay? Their words and their deeds need to line up. Verse th Verse 34, think not that I've come to send peace on earth. It came not to send peace, but a sword. Why does he go into this? Because he says, when you truly confess me with your life that you live, not just your words, but the life that you live, you're keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ, that blessed hope, the judgment seat. You're working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What's going to happen? Verse 35, For I have come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. I'll get into it a little bit, but my daughter, at this point, has pretty much written me off. Ever since I got saved, I'll, I'll talk about it afterwards, I cut things out of my life, and she just doesn't get it when she was young. I just don't get it. We used to do it. It's my fault. I wish I had gotten saved sooner. Verse 37, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy than of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. In other words, your own life is not, if it's more important than Jesus Christ, you're not worthy of him. Okay, he that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. There it is. Jesus is not God the Father. Then you're not receiving who sent Jesus Christ. Jesus is God the Father. Body, soul, and spirit. Jesus Christ is the body. God the Father is the soul. The Holy Spirit is the spirit. I know I have Brother Brian keeps using the word being, being. That's not, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches the Godhead is one person. And that person is Jesus Christ body. He has God the Father in the Holy Ghost, or in the Holy Ghost in him. But he's got God the Father, which is the soul, body, soul. They're one. If you look at Jesus Christ, you've seen God the Father. Why? Because they are one. There's only one God the Bible teaches. One God, one God, one God. I'm going off on this again. One God, one God. Apologize, brother and sister Christ. One God, okay? It's the Father. It's the soul. The soul is God. If you claim Jesus is God, you're saying he, the body and the soul are one. And they are. Okay? I can't explain how it works. That's the mystery. Okay? You have three parts. That's the mystery. But the Bible clearly defines the Godhead as body, soul, and spirit, and that Jesus is the person of the Godhead. He has a body. He has a soul. God the Father in him. And he has a spirit, the Holy Spirit. We are made in His image. We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. Not image, I'm sorry, I said it wrong. We are made in His likeness. Man is made in His image, the body, physically. God is a man, Adam is a man. Man was made in the image of God. Men and women, when it talks about body, soul, and spirit, were made in the likeness of God. Okay, image is always something you can see in the Bible. It's never phil philosophical, meaning body, soul, and spirit. No. Image is something you can see. Okay, whether you're imagining it, an image in your head, or it's physically there, it's an image that you can see. And I've always got to correct myself. Man was made in the image of God, but women were made of the man. It talks about in another passage. Okay, where it's talking about physical image. Women were taken from man. Eve was taken from Adam. Okay, people always say I'm trying to be... Uh, promote sexism or whatever, just all kinds of terms and names and everything. I'm just preaching what the Bible teaches. Right? Sorry to go off on that. 
But um, just remember, though, okay, the Godhead, stand for the real Jesus Christ. Trinity, get you back in the world. Okay? But you see here, everything's not going to be right with your family when you get saved. You're going to be bumping shoulders on your walk with the Lord. You're swimming upstream. You're going to have them attack you. They're going to be the biggest people that are, the people that were the closest people to you when you got saved not brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm talking about before you got saved, the closest people to you when you get saved are going to be your enemy. Either they'll they'll see the light that's in you and they'll want what you have and you might be able to lead some of them to Christ. But most of them, it's just the way the Bible says, the most of them are going to become your enemy. They're going to do everything they can because if they're not saved, they can be used of Satan. Okay? And they're going to do everything they can to hinder your walk with the Lord. They're going to do everything they can to hinder your sanctification. God's sanctifying your life through His Word. I've had it happen to me. I used to be my mom's movie buddy. I cut out movies. It's almost like we had nothing in common. And she, kept, she keeps quoting movies that I used to watch, tempting me. And she's always wondering why I'm not just going to movies anymore. I used to be my movie buddy all the time. It's just nagging me, trying to pull me. You're going the wrong way. Go with the, the flow. Go with the stream. You're going the wrong way. You're going against the stream. That's the way we're supposed to be going. Okay. Acts 10.34 says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Why am I reading this? Because we're going to start going into talking about, it's not just family, okay? They're trying to get you to worship men. You, if you've come out of these Babel building systems, you understand exactly what I'm saying. Okay, worship leader. Oh, he's a worship leader. And they, he starts getting elevated where they're giving praise to the worship leader. Youth pastor, chapter and verse on that. Children's pastor, chapter and verse on that. Or even the pastor himself. Okay, well God, he's a man of God, so we don't have to hold him to the same standards that we hold each other. He's higher, okay? Don't you dare question the man of God, okay? Peter says God's not a respecter of persons. The best example I know of this is you go all the way back to Genesis 4-6. Turn to Genesis 4-6. Best story, I love it. Okay? Cain and Abel. And the Lord said unto Cain, I'll give a head, I didn't read the whole story, but the thing is, is you have Cain and Abel. He said, okay, they both decide they're going to bring something and offer it to God as a gift offering. And Cain uh, brings the fruit of the land. Abel brings the firstling of his flock. Okay? And God looks at Abel and says, and takes, um, I hate to use, I'm trying not to use the wrong, he has favor towards his offering, but towards Cain's offering, he doesn't have any favor. That's where we're at. Okay? So, is God a respecter of persons? Oh yeah, he, he just likes Cain because it's Cain. Or, no, I'm sorry, Abel, I said it backwards. He loves Abel's offering because it's Abel, it's the man himself. He's just a respecter of persons. Let's read what he says here. Genesis 4, 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? God's not a respecter of persons. If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Your flesh gets in charge. God has set standards. Hey, I always preach this. Um, Cain could have gone to Abel and said, Can I have a firstling of your flock? Can I have something that will please God? He could have done that, taken it, and please God, and God would have had respect to him the same way he respected Abel's offering. If thou doest right, will that not be accepted? If thou doest well, I'm sorry, if thou doest well, shall that not be accepted? But if not, Cain refused to do it. Sin lieth at the door. He got to the point where he got so mad at his brother, he slew him. It's the biggest example. It's the first example of God not being a respecter of persons. He didn't respect Abel's offering because it's Abel, the man. No, it's because he did well according to the Lord. Cain could have done the same thing. 
But he didn't. He chose to fight the Lord and do his own thing, and it got to the point where it ate him up inside and sin lieth at the door, and he winded up killing his brother. Turn to 1 Corinthians 1.11. Here it is happening today. Okay, they think that God is a respecter of persons, and you have certain men that are men of God, and they're above reproach. Okay, And you start falling into the trap where instead of keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ and His perfect written word and following Him, you start falling into the trap of following a man. Okay. 1 Corinthians 1.11 For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chol, that there are contentions among you. There's fighting going on. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Some of them were saying it right. I'm of Christ. Okay. 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? When I'm trying to preach truth to some of the people that are just, they're, you can tell men followers, Especially when it comes to Robert Breaker. Okay, they're of Robert Breaker. Robert Breaker was crucified for him. They were baptized in the name of Robert Breaker. You could tell that by their attitude. They, they are followers of men. You say, this is what the scriptures say. He's lying to you. They won't listen. Same thing with Edward P.F. That whole crowd's all about the flesh. They just love to gossip, bicker, argue. It's just the biggest thing with that group. Okay, and he's a deceiver, and we show from the scriptures he's wrong. But you have them that follow men. Now here's the thing. It happens even with people. Those are people I believe are lost. King's Table, Edward P.F., Robert Breaker, Steve Anderson. Uh, there's people that are, I believe are saved that when you call out their sin, you have people, even brethren, that fall into the trap of worshiping a man. David Daniels at, at uh, Chick Publications. I had to stop supporting his current ministry. Because he's off to the left when the Bible's going right. Okay? I had to. And when you explain to people and you show them scripture, they choose the man, David Daniels, over the Bible. Over Jesus Christ. Same thing happens with Brother Brian. There's areas where he's wrong, and we show through scriptures where he's wrong, and you'll still have people stand there trying to vehemently defend him. Why? Because even he has people that worship him. I probably am going to get people, if I don't already, that just think, oh, he sounds great and everything. They're not following along in the Bible like you're supposed to be, and you're not holding me accountable to the Bible. They start lifting me up to the point where they're worshiping the man, Philip Newton. Was I crucified for you? Were you baptized in my name? No. Make sure that this is your final authority. The cares of this world, that's one of the things that I was really had to break you from is if you came out of these Babel buildings, it's really pushed into you that that's the man of God and you don't question the man of God and he's held to different standards. In other words, he can get away with sin. He can get away with going against this book. He can get away with teach, teaching falsehoods. You don't question him. And that's a big thing you've got to come out of and say, you know what? I'm going to follow Jesus Christ and this is my final authority. Lord, there's things I don't understand. Help me to understand. Help me to see the truth, having a love of the truth in your heart. God's word sown in your heart. What gets in the way of the word that God has sown in your heart from being fruitful? Cares of this world, the praise of men, whether it be these people, these people in Babel buildings or family members. Be very, very careful today, especially with the way the world's going. You know, family members gonna turn you in. Oh, I gotta be fearful, I gotta be feel fearful. Trust the Lord. Continue to live in the life of Christ. Who knows? You might last minute lead one of your family members to Christ. Even through everything this world's going through, through all our persecution that we've had on our nephew or our cousin or our son or whatever, he's been strong for the Lord and he still has been kind to us. Preaching truth. He didn't compromise, but he's been kind to us. Maybe there's something to what he's saying. Maybe I need to get to know this Jesus he's talking about. Maybe I need to have him show me this Bible version issue. Why is it that big of a deal? That's what led me to the real Jesus Christ, is learning the Bible version issue first, then learning the true plan of salvation found in the King James Bible, and then I was point, that's when I found the real Jesus Christ. I was a false convert most of my life. Who knows? God does. But we're still supposed to live like that. 
so we can wait for that door to open. You're going to have people in your life that are going to fall for worshiping men over God. They want the praise of men over God. I'm just so in such a hurry to get a praise from that man instead of getting a praise from God. I mean, when someone tells me that, hey, to God be the glory, I thank God for using you, they're giving God the glory. But when you have people that sit there and go, oh, you did the best study in the world, and it's the best study ever, and you just do an amazing you, 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 what's going on? I'm getting patted on the back, I'm getting the praise of men. I'd rather get the praise of God. Through men, absolutely. But like I said, they'll come out and say, well, God has used you greatly, thank you. God has shown me so much through your ministry. Oh God, that study you did, God helped me get this out of my life, and God helped me get that out of my life. Be careful with your words. Words have meaning. I'd rather get a praise of God through you than to have you praise me and pat me on the back. That's very important. And with man praise and man worship, the big push is also to follow man. It gets your eyes distracted to looking at the world again and becoming followers of men instead of being followers of God. My warning is, please, please, please be careful not to be caught up in a lot of the drama that you see on YouTube. Okay, that's what Edward P.F. was about. I don't know what he's about now because I haven't, like I said, you don't follow him. He's a person who's, um, gosh, supposed to be after the first and second admonition reject. Someone that's in a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, reject him. But back when I have actually talked to Edward P.F. through typing, to chat, and Robert Breaker and them and everything, but with Edward P.F. and King's Table, I've talked to him and all those people. They're all about drama. They're all about debating, backbiting, the Bible words are, debating, backbiting, uh, contention, you know, fighting. That's what they're all about. Arguing, fighting, and, and uh, gossip. Okay? Uh, just don't get caught in all the drama. Get away from it. Okay? I don't want anything to do with it. Because okay? uh, you got to be careful. When you get start getting caught in the drama, and this, is, this one is directed at men in ministry, just a warning. And this is for everybody, but especially men in ministry. When you get caught in the drama that's going on, and you start addressing the lost world, other than to preach the gospel to them, you start casting pearls before swine. And what happens? They will turn around and rend you. I've seen ministries get rended by the lost world. And those ministries, I hate to see it happen, but please don't take this as me being heartless. They deserve it. Why? Because the Bible said you're casting pearls before swine. You're addressing the lost world other than to preach the gospel to them. What's going to happen? They will turn around and rend you. It's almost like chastening from the Lord. It's rending they will rend you and God allow it to happen to put you back in your place. Okay, sorry Lord, I should have only addressed them to preach the gospel. Other than that, I had nothing to do with them. I am making videos addressed to saved sinners only. And if I mention lost people, or like I'm not mention, you can mention lost people to save sinners. When I'm addressing lost people, it better be to preach the plan of salvation. If it's not, I need to stop addressing the lost world. Period. They're not going to get this book. They don't care. What are you doing? You're casting pearls before swine. And they're going to turn around and rend you again. Okay? Don't fall into the trap of the cares of this world where you start caring what the lost world says. Okay? The only time, I, I have to say this, the only time that really get to me where the lost world, what they say, should get to you is when you find yourself being a hypocrite. And you say, you realize, I've stopped swimming, i floated 20 feet back, and the things that I stood against, I'm doing. The world's using that against me. I'm setting a bad example for Jesus Christ. What do you do? Repent, forsake, and get back to your walk with the Lord. He is faithful to forgive. You ask for forgiveness, you get it out of your life. I can do all things through Christ with strength. May God help me get it out of my life. And you get back to serving the Lord. That's usually the only time. I mean, even if you want to argue that, it's usually the only Usually you have a brother and sister in Christ that will come to you first. But the lost world likes to see where you're wrong, and they really like to drive it in. 
when you are wrong according to Scripture. But you don't take that and go, well, the lost world's saying it. I don't have to listen to them. Ultimately, it's this book that you're listening to. And if they're trying to use it against you because you're doing something wrong, correct yourself. Do right according to the book. Okay? But like I said, even then, I'd rather have a brother. We're supposed to have brothers and sisters in Christ. We're supposed to be um, accountable one to another, confessing our faults one to another. We're supposed to be standing up to one another with courage, love, kindness, but with courage to say, hey, what you're doing there is wrong. Don't fall into the trap. Well, you know, I don't want to be alone or isolated, so I, I'm not going to cause friction. But the Word of God said, oh, I don't want to cause friction. I've lost fellowship with some brethren because the, God put it on my heart and said, you see what they're doing in their life? What does the Bible say? And I sat there, and as kind as I possibly could, with as much love as I can muster, but God gave me the courage to stand up to them and say, listen, what you're doing is wrong according to the Scriptures. They didn't like it. I lost the fellowship. You've got to be willing to risk it all sometimes to stand for Jesus Christ. And you can't let the cares of this world, I might lose friends. I might lose fellowship. Get in the way. All this guy's a man of God, you know, I'm one of his. I can't stand to have him say something bad about me. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says, here's the verse, it says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. This is Paul. I should have put this up with the other verses, but I remember it's down here. Okay. We're supposed to be following Jesus Christ. Paul set the example. We follow Paul because Paul's following Jesus Christ. Some people say, I'm following the example that Brother Philip sets, but my example should come from here. You're still supposed to hold me accountable to this. I'm doing my best to follow Jesus Christ and keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. He can come back any day now. Okay? And I'll read it again. Philippians 3.17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so you have us for an example. Paul wasn't sitting there going, I'm a man of God so I have different standards. Okay, There's things I can do and get away with, but you're not allowed to do and get away with. He's not saying that. We set the example for you guys to follow. But remember, I'm following Jesus Christ. It's not me that's the foundation. It's Jesus Christ. It's His perfect written word. Not me. Remember that. John 9, 18, we read another example from the Bible of people that were more scared of what men thought and wanted the praise of men. Let's read this. John 9, 19 says, And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know, not, we know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. Why are they doing this? Verse 22. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews. Not God. The Jews. For the Jews had already agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. I know a brother in Christ. I was asking people to pray for him way back then. I still have his picture of him and his family on my prayer wall. His name is Alex. I remember him standing up to his pastor who was teaching that the Godhead had nothing to do with the Trinity. Godhead just means that Jesus has qualities of God. Some of the qualities of God. He was teaching Satanism that the Trinity is God and that's who you need to worship. He was teaching Satanism and he stood up to that man. What happened? He was kicked out of that Babel building. That pastor that's a hireling, that's a servant of Satan, poisoned the ear of his wife, and his wife took his kids, and, and his wife left him. Why? Because he feared God over fearing men. He feared God. Okay? Are you willing to risk it all? This, these, these parents weren't. They were too scared. 
We'll just say what they want to hear and we'll just go with the flow. John 12, 42. Turn to John 12, 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. So you have people that come out and say, you don't have to confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. These people, I know it's a different dispensation, but these people believed in Jesus Christ, but they did not confess him. Here, the belief was up here, but they didn't confess him down here. Why? Lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Here's another reason why. They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. Why? Verse 43, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They believed, but they didn't confess. They loved the praise of men over the praise of God. Where were these people at when Jesus was being crucified? Going along with the crowd, because they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue, so they go along with the crowd. They go along with the Pharisees, yelling at Jesus and spitting at him, but they believed. Okay, head belief. But they loved the praise of men. Don't fall into that trap. Don't fall in the trap. Well, I got to get a praise from Brother Brian. I got to get a praise from Brother Philip Newton. I got to get a praise from Brother JT. I got to get a praise from whoever. Okay? Um, Brother in Christ. I don't know why my brain freezes sometimes because he doesn't use his name. He, he's got a, a ministry title type thing. But there's other brethren out there. You, I got to get a praise from them. I got to get a praise from them. Okay? Um, no. You need praise from God, okay? Make sure you're following this book. And the men that you care about and you respect, don't hold them up to a higher level, but that you respect, make sure they line up with this book. And the things that God has done for you through their lives, make sure under their videos you're making comments saying, hey, God has really used you in my life. God has got this out of my life through His ministry through you. God's got that. That's what really touches our heart. Not when we're getting patted on the back, but when God's getting all the glory. And that we know that God is using us. We get to see God using us in this world. This wicked, wicked world. It means a lot to us, brothers and sisters in Christ. Be careful not to be patting us on the back. But the number one thing I want to point out is you're going to find this in organized religion. Going back to newly saved that are coming out of these Babel buildings or false religions. You're going to find this in the false religion more than anything. In these Babel buildings that they try to call church buildings. It's big time in there. Okay? They don't want to be kicked out of their little club. And so they want the praise of men. Whatever, who's ever in charge of that little group over there. Okay? Like I said, I still pray for Alex, Brother Alex. Standing for the King James Bible and what's an absolute truth. And he's risked it all. He's got kicked out of his occult, praise the Lord, Babel building. He's got... But he had his wife and his children, they, they, they had taken away. His wife turned on him. Children, and his wife and some of the, other, the church, that Babel building, got his kids to turn on him. That's tough. Mm -hmm. uh, next thing that we're going to talk about real quick, I'm sorry this is a long study. I'll try to see about breaking it into parts. If it's a two-hour study, I might leave it as a full two-hour study. Just stop it. Take a break, come back to this study in certain parts. But I really wanted to get through all this stuff it's ASAP. It's just important to me. I don't care how long the video gets, how many parts the video is. I want to get this out because the Lord's put it on my heart. Another care of this world we talked about when it comes to men pleasing, but more specifically when it comes to wives and husbands. Yes, I'm bringing that up. I know some people won't. Yes, I'm bringing it up, okay? Cares of this world. Can a wife or can a husband become a care of this world that starts hindering your walk with the Lord? A lost husband, lost wives, mainly with this pointed towards, but even saved sometimes. If they're off somewhere, could they hinder you? Yeah. 1 Corinthians 7.29. Turn to 1 Corinthians 7.29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be those they that have none. This is Paul talking about his days. How much more so today? And this, um, and this is talking about, me more than anything, I try to address this to people that are married to lost people. Brothers and sisters in Christ that are married to lost people. Okay? And they that weep as though they wept not, 
and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not. Over time, we, I've seen so many brethren that get in ministry that when they were poor, they did more for the Lord when they were poor, but now that their ministry is kind of strong and they're getting more donations and more money coming in and they've got more stuff, their ministry isn't as strong as it once was when they were poor. I remember uh, Brother Brian talking about in the past uh, how poor they were, him and his wife, when they first got married, that they went, I can't remember if it was a week, maybe longer, without meat. They were just eating vegetables, like soup, trying to make soups out of vegetables, something cheap. They were poor when they first got started out in marriage. Okay? But those they possess not, sometimes you can start getting so much stuff that you forget to be content with food and raiment. And it starts becoming cares of this world, and they start distracting you. They might not necessarily be a sin at first, but when they become a care of this world, and they start distracting you from the ministry, or from your walk with the Lord, it becomes a sin. Okay. That's why it be as those they possess not. It's better off not to have it. Just better off not to have it. Verse 31, And they that use this, this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried, care for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. Now even for saved sinners, where you're both saved, this could still, you know, with Paul saying here is, I want to get ahead of myself. He's saying you need to be on your guard. You get married to someone who's a Bible-believing, God-fearing man. Sisters in Christ, you find a Bible-believing, God-fearing man, you get married to him. This still applies to, to you. Men out there, it still applies to you. You need to have your guard up. Be sober. Be vigilant. Okay? Let's read this. But he that is married, care for the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Any man that stands up there and says, I never have a problem with this, he's a liar. Oh, I never have a problem with this when it comes to my wife. He's a liar. Verse 34. Let's see. You know. oh, yeah, verse 34. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Sisters in Christ that are married to a saved man. If you sit there and say, you never have a problem with this, this never is a temptation, and this never comes into play at all, you're a liar. I'm calling you out. The Bible's calling you out. Paul's sitting here and he's saying, you're getting married... This is going to be something that's going to be a temptation the whole time you're married. To the time that you get married, to the time you die or become a widow. You're going to struggle with this. It's going to be a struggle. Verse 35. And this I speak for your own profit. It's a warning. Not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is calmly, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. I've seen it in some of the brethren in ministries where wives become a distraction. I've seen some sisters in Christ talk about how sometimes it can become a distraction for the husband. Okay? But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely towards a virgin, I'm going to keep reading, because some people don't, towards his virgin, if she pass the flower of a of her age and need so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. What Paul is saying is not saying you shouldn't get married. What he's saying though is that if for any reason, not any reason, but the reasons he said, you know, if you burn one towards another and it's a calling, God calls you to be a head covering for women men out there, and women, God blesses you with the head covering that's a husband. We're going to talk about in a second, there's multiple head coverings. For a woman, but the main head covering a woman should always be praying for is a husband. But the point is, is he's warning you that if you get called into this and you get married, you're going to struggle with this. You're going to start falling into the cares of the world and start worrying more about how to please your wife over pleasing the Lord. And men in ministry, you choose to get married while in ministry, or you're already married and God calls you into ministry, you need to be very careful. 
not to fall into the cares of this world, letting the cares of this world come in and care about pleasing your wife more than pleasing the Lord. I have seen this in people's lives. Okay. Um, I just, I have. I have seen it in my own life. I married a lost woman who had said everything the right way. She, her words lined up with the Bible, but her works did not. And when confronted hardcore on her works, her words changed. Her true self came out. She's not a King James Bible believer. Okay? I fell into the trap where I started doing things that I knew were wrong in order to please her. I think I mentioned this in my testimony video, warning the brethren that when you marry someone, you make sure that their walk and their talk line up with the Word of God. Sisters in Christ, same thing. You see a man out there, he talks a good talk, but that's where a head covering comes in for the sisters in Christ. You're supposed to have some kind of head covering, some man in authority over you protecting you. So when some guy comes by and he has all the right words, that head covering can look and say, wait a second, he's not living those words. Stay away from my daughter. It could be a father. Stay away from my sister. It could be an elder brother. Stay away from my si this sister in Christ. You stay away from her. Okay? You're supposed to have some kind of head covering, some kind of authority. But the thing is, is words and deed, they didn't line up. I failed the Lord by not making sure both of them lined up. We talked about God's word all the time. Come to find out she was a parrot, what I call a PWC. Polly won a cracker. Some of you know what that means. It's like a parrot. It's in other words, they just parrot what other people said. She would repeat what Peter Ruckman said. She would repeat what Brother Brian said. But it wasn't in here. She was just a parrot. She started repeating some of the things I said in the studies because I was just newly in getting into ministry. Okay? I failed the Lord because I gave in to please her. I bought her alcohol once and I gave her money a second time knowing she was going to buy cigarettes and alcohol with it. I failed her. What happened? I cared more for the things of this world and pleasing her. So I just get her off my back. Just get her off my back. Give in, give in, give in. It's tough. I, I did that study on justification for divorce or separation, and I stand by what the Bible preaches and teaches to this day. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you get saved, and your other, significant others, they say, but your husband or your wife is lost, whichever you are, two things are going to happen. If they're happy to dwell with you and live, you're going to say, I'm going to live a godly life from this day forward. I'm going to live for Jesus Christ from this day forward. Are you happy to live that way with me? If they're happy to dwell with you, they'll get saved. If they're not happy to dwell with you, they will leave. Some, some situations, you might have to leave. Okay? But it's not going to work out, basically. Those are the only two outcomes when you get saved. There is no, he rejects that, my, my lost husband rejects Jesus Christ, but we're happy to live together. No, you're compromising left and right, and he's pulling you away from the Lord. And vice versa. It never works that way. There is no, he, he's lost, I'm saved, and we can live happily ever after. It never, ever works works that way. I stood my ground, stood for the Word of God, this home will be a Bible-believing, God-fearing home, and everything went kaput, exploded in my face. Her true self, everything, everything fell apart, she took off. Well, I had to send her back to her mom's because she was out of control and she wasn't happy to dwell with me. I sent her back to her mom's. What'd she do? Go back to her mom's, repent, say, hey, you know what, I'm doing wrong by my husband, and I need to do right. No, what'd she do? She went and committed adultery. Got with another man just like that. No conviction. Now I'm free to divorce her. But I didn't mean to go off on that too much. But the point is, when it comes to a wife or a husband, if they're lost, those are the two outcomes. They'll either get saved, or they're going bye-bye. They're gone. They're not happy to dwell with you. They're gone. Now, if they're saved, be very careful. This is written to save sinners. 
You can fall into the trap of trying to please your husband or please your wife over pleasing God and get you to do things you know in your heart isn't right. But that struggle will always be there. Okay. And then sisters in Christ, like I said before, head covering. The reason this talks about, I believe it talks about women and it talks about men, is we're going to mention some women in here that are in ministry that are helping the ministry out. Some are married, some are single. Okay, But the point is, Women can help out in ministry. They can't preach. They can't teach. They're not to exert the authority of man. But they can help out. They can help take care of some of these men that are single in ministry. And these men can be their head covering. Paul was a head covering, I believe, for some of the women. Especially some of the women he thanked. And he sent some women here to help these people out, like the elder women, to teach the younger women good things. Or to help some men in ministry out cooking, clothes, whatnot. You know, making clothes, repairing clothes, because you're, you're living poor and whatnot, helping the brethren out. But a head covering for a woman doesn't have to necessarily be a husband. It can be a father. The father is ultimately the head covering for his daughter until she gets married. That's how the Bible, if everything went perfect in this world today, the father's saved, the daughter's saved, you're going according to the Bible, that father is the head covering for that daughter. Even if the father is lost, he's still a head covering for that daughter. And any time he goes against scripture, that saved daughter is supposed to obey God first, rather than man. But like we said before, there's times that the lost world has laws and everything that line up with the word of God. Because the laws of God are written on every man's heart. She's supposed to have some kind of head covering. And it's supposed to be the father until she moves out. And if she never gets married, that father is her head covering. She becomes, that father dies someday, she's old, someone, el, deacon, an elder in the church, remember Paul, not Paul, Peter, had to assign some men for the widows. They were being neglected, they, weren't, they had no head covering. So he assigned some men to take care of them. So they could, so they could focus on preaching only. But it's there, there's different head coverings, but a woman, you're supposed to have a head covering. And i got to point this out. My biggest thing that I would say, let's see if i got it in my notes. Uh, first, let's go, let's talk, I want to talk about when it talks about women there not getting married. What's it talking about? 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be ye followers of me, even, all as, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. We read that before, but now I praise, verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinance as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every man, woman that prayeth or prophesy with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even as all, even all one as if she were shaven. Okay, that's, I was talking the talk a lot, but now I'm trying to use scripture to back it up. Okay, a woman's supposed to have a head covering, period, and that head covering has to be a man. She can't be her own head covering, and that head covering cannot be another woman. It is a man. And the man's head covering cannot be a woman. The man's head covering is Jesus Christ. That's the way God set it up. Okay, you say, well, there's some women in the Bible... Like I said, I believe that the men, the leaders, were head coverings for him. Paul, Timothy, some of the men that were with him. Turn to Romans 16, 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of Christ, which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succour of many, and of myself also. Help her. Okay. And it says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Some of the people, I believe, they hit them. You read in the Old Testament about the Jews and the walls of Jericho, how uh, Rahab the harlot hid the Jews that went in to spy out the area. Okay. What's going on here? Uh, 
The Christians are still being hunted. Okay, the Christians are being treated bad. They saved my life. They probably hid Paul. Protected him. All right. But there are sisters in Christ that say, I'm going to do more for the ministry. I'm going to take care of some men in ministry. Okay, I'll cook for them. I'll clean for them. You know, house church, I'll clean for them. I will, you know, do things to help them so it takes those burdens off their shoulders so they can preach the word more. And do more for the Lord Jesus Christ as men in ministry. Okay, that is there. But the head covering can be a husband, a father, a deacon, a pastor. But the whole point is a woman is supposed to be under the authority of a man, period. It's what the Bible says. Okay, 1 Corinthians 16, 9 says, The church of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the churches in their own house. We read that verse earlier, but I want to read it again. Okay. Women can help out in the ministry, but the thing is, is today women are being told they can be men. They can be their own head covering. You've got this care of this world. The world is... I pray for the sisters in Christ. And I have sisters... My feet are hurting a little bit. I have my sisters in Christ that will talk to me about feminism, how it's a struggle in their life. I don't know of one true, that's honest, true sister in Christ that doesn't, that's, that's honest, will say, I struggle with feminism. Doesn't matter how Christian they look, or how Christian they act, or how hardcore they are for this book, and doing things the way of this book, it's always a struggle for them. Because in this world today, feminism is shoved down every woman's throat. Your home is the only home that can be a Bible-believing, God-fearing home. The moment you leave your house, feminism is shoved down your throat. And you're getting told that you can be your own head covering. And the way Satan destroys a home is he'll go after the wife first. We've said this in other studies. He'll go after the wife first. Who is he to tell you what to do? You can be your own man. You can make your own decisions. You can do whatever you want. Dress however you want. Who's he to tell you what to do? It might not be a husband. It might be a father. He's might talk about who's that father to tell you what to do. And I'm not talking about the Catholic Satanism. I'm talking about your father that you were, you have father and mother. Okay. Who's that pastor to tell you what to do? Who's that man to tell you what to do? Sisters in Christ, I hear this a lot in the comment sections. I hear this so much. I want a good man of God. I want a good man of God. I'm going to be straight out honest with you from my mistakes and from what I've seen. If you are not under the head covering of a man right now, you're not ready for marriage. Period. If you're not already getting that into your heart that I'm going to be under a head covering of man, some kind of man authority, so I'm not falling into the feminism of the world of who's a man to tell me what to do, you're not ready for marriage. I'm sorry. Men out there will flip it around. Men. I've had men say, well, I want to get married, I want to get married. And they live with family. They live with best friends. They live in a little studio apartment that's like a bedroom. I, was, I stayed in a, bed, a studio apartment that was a bedroom. It was like $200 a month. And this was way back when I was 20. Um, $200 a month. It was a little bedroom that had a bed that was built in. So you had a little space on the left side to walk to the, the nightstand, a little space on the right side. At the foot of the bed, there was a little desk. Had a microwave and one of those mini fridges. Then we had a little bedroom, or bathroom, just a little bathroom. That's the size of the room. I had a part-time job where I was paying that and barely getting by. Was I ready financially to, to get married? Absolutely not. I've seen men in ministry who've made that mistake of getting married before they're ready to. Financially. And because of that, you turn around and you make bad decisions to try to support your family, your wife. Men in ministry, you need to make sure you have a good home, but not just any home, a godly home. A Bible-believing, God-fearing home, abstain from all appearance of evil, free zone, that I always call it. Okay, You need to make sure you have a home. You need to make sure you can provide for her physically and spiritually. If I have a young man that comes to me and says, I just got saved, and I'm thinking of getting married, my first thing I'll tell them is absolutely not. 
You cannot provide for a wife spiritually if you're newly saved. Okay? You need to get with the Lord and say, Lord, help me with my life. And the Lord needs to clean up your life and get your life on the right track. Remember, you're turning around doing a 180. You're going to have to get used to going against the flow. If you're not used to going against the flow, you won't be able to protect a wife that's going against the flow. Okay? It's that simple. Okay? If you're newly saved, you're not ready for married. Uh, not ready for marriage, men. Okay? If you cannot physically and spiritually provide for that woman, that wife that you want to marry, that woman you want to marry, you're not ready for marriage. And for women, I'm sorry, just the biggest thing to hammer home is this. If you don't have a head covering right now, you're not married. A spiritual head covering. You're not ready for marriage. It used to be, I used to tell people, uh, men would ask me their advice. I'd be like, okay, is she studying to be a good keeper at home now? Well, if she's got a good head covering, that's a spiritual head covering, they would be pushing her to, hey, practice. You might have to have a little job here for now, but don't put... Stock in that job, focus on practicing being a good keeper at home. Grow your hair out long, because the Bible says you're to have long hair. Wear modest dresses all the time. But ultimately, when you have women that vehemently defend pants, that vehemently defend short hair, there's nothing wrong with me having a job. This is, I can have my own home, I can have my own car, mine, my stuff, I can have... Ultimately, she's a feminist. She has no head covering. The Bible condemns that. That's wrong. A woman is to have a head covering, and that head covering is supposed to be a man. So I just sum it all up by saying, sisters in Christ, the desperate, I want to have a good man, a good godly man, a husband, you need to make sure that you have a head covering now. And I know that's hard for some of the sisters in Christ out there. Okay? There's few saved men out there, but like I said, not necessarily saying it has to be a saved man, it has to be just under the authority of a man. But like I said, when that authority, whether it's the government, because I always, we talk about the government authority, versus God's authority, man's authority versus God's authority, even a saved wife, saved husband, sometimes it's going to be rare probably, but there's still going to be times where you're going to say, I'm going to stand for the word of God, I believe my husband's wrong. Or the husband's like, I'm going to stand for the word of God, and my wife is wrong. The wife should follow her husband's example, but there's sometimes the husband might be wrong. And you're just going to have to, there's a way to do it, being respectful to all another study. But brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the cares of this world that can pull you away from your walk with the Lord is a wife or husband that's lost. Definitely if they're lost. And you start compromising, compromising, compromising so that you guys can live together happily ever after. It will destroy your walk with the Lord. Men in ministry. I had to step down from the ministry for a while. Men in ministry. You marry a lost woman or you get saved while married to a lost woman. You can't get in ministry. Okay, not until your house is in order. Okay, the Bible says that. For, they say, well, it's a bishop. You need to be careful. Making little videos here and there is one thing. But trying to really get into ministry and preach and teach the word and everything and your house is not in order. You're not supposed to do that. It, they will destroy your walk with the Lord being married to a lost person. Because you'll start, in order for them to be happy to dwell with you, they don't conform to you, to the Word of God, and, and your life as a Christian. They're always going to get you to conform to them. They'll get you to compromise and start turning your back on the Word of God. It'll happen every time. And to people that are saved, that they're both saved, husband and wife, you still got to be very careful of the cares of this world, husbands especially. Well, I want my wife to have the best things. Some of the wives are like, I'm content with food and raiment. It's okay if we live poor. And the husbands just keep, oh, no, no, I want her to have the best. I want her to have the best. Not that we're going to live rich, but I want her to have the best. And it becomes a care of this world, and it takes them away from their walk with the Lord and from their real responsibilities. Watering their wife by the word. Men in ministry, I've seen it happen especially. It's not just with wives and, and husbands, it'll happen with kids too. Kids come along and you start falling into the trap of, well, I want the best for them. And, and, and you start getting stressed by the cares of this world and it distracts you from your walk with the Lord. 
There's nothing wrong with making sure they have clothes on their back, food in their stomach, that you're raising them in the admonition of the Lord. They don't need the best home ever. You know, this expensive home. You know, just want to throw that out there, that one of the biggest cares of this world that I've seen in some men, and I, like I said, I look up to Alex, Brother Alex. I really do. His wife left him and his children left him because he stood for the Word of God. He called out a preacher that was preaching and teaching Satanism. And he lost a lot. But he's standing. I hope to this day, I haven't heard from him in a long time, I hope to this day that he's still standing for the Word of God. But there are some people out there that they'll cave in. Okay, I was wrong. Okay, just to keep their wife there, to keep their kids there, to make the people happy in that Babel building. He could have caved in any time and just turned his back on God's Word and went with the flow. But the one man that you hear stories like Brother Alex that will stand up to that stuff, there's probably about 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 to 80 to 100 people that cave in and compromise. I've seen it. I've corrected some brethren saying, hey, you're compromising. Your home's supposed to be a godly home. What's going on? And they always use the excuse, I'm married to a lost woman. It shouldn't be that way. Not the married to a lost woman. I'm talking about they, he got saved while he was, they were both lost. But you're, you're safe now. You make your home a godly home. She's happy to dwell with you. She can stay. She's not happy to dwell with you. There's the door. I did a study on how the Bible preaches and teaches that. If you're not happy to, to live as I do, sisters in Christ, you leave. You go stay with your father. It's not divorce. Please go watch that study, Justification for Divorce or Separation. It's not divorce, it's separation. He's not happy to dwell with you. You're not in bondage to him, but it's not divorce. All right. Now, real quick, a few other things that we'll talk about, that's, uh, and we're going to wrap this up, that's cares of this world, is responsibilities. Sometimes you can take on too many responsibilities, and it'll eat away at you, especially men in ministry. The whole point of being full-time ministry is... You get as much as the cares of this world other people take care of and help you with. You might be blessed to have a wife. But more than anything, we're supposed to be donating to ministries to help free up time so you can spend most of your time in ministry. Okay? There's no such thing as a full-time minister. I'm, I'm in full-time ministry, but I'm a farmer that farms this land. Have you ever watched how farmers live? It's very detailed. It takes a lot of work. There's no way you can be a pastor, a preacher, and a teacher and be a full-time farmer. Okay, and so on and so forth. Might not be a farmer. It might be something else. But 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But if any man provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And people will use that as an excuse. Yes, Men, like I said, you're not ready for marriage if you can't provide for your own. But you can fall into the trap of going too far and saying, well, I want the best, I want better, I want better, I want better, we need a bigger house, okay? One property is not good enough, I need multiple properties. One vehicle isn't good enough, I need multiple vehicles, okay? I bought her a couple dresses, but now i got to go out and get a second job because I want her to have ten dresses. She can live with two dresses. And like I said, some sisters in Christ... They're okay with that, and then it's the men that have the problem, but a lot of times, it's the women. I want ten dresses. I want a better life. You need to learn to be content. Mm -hmm. You need to be content, especially those in ministry. This warning is more than anything for men in ministry. Okay, you say, "Hey, I'm going to be." I, I said, "I'm in ministry. I'm preaching, but I've never stood here and said I'm full-time ministry." I've taken some donations from the brethren to get the camera that I'm using right now. And I want to thank the brethren again for helping me get this camera. At the time I needed this camera, the old camera was just going bad. Everything around this house was falling apart. And I was putting all this money into fixing things like the well. The pump went out in the well. The pump went out underneath the house. And I just couldn't afford to get a new camera. And I told the body of Christ, and the body of Christ rallied together. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. To God be the glory. You got me a camera. But if you're going to get into to where you say, I'm full-time ministry, I'm full-time ministry, 
then you need to be careful not to be taking on all these other responsibilities of the world because they're always going to get in the way of you trying to be full-time ministry. Mm -hmm. And like I said, some people step on their toes because uh, off-grid living, Brother Brian, he really pushes off-grid living, but there's times where I look at his ministry and back in the past when he lived on in the house during the winter um, in the city, and then was working at building his log cabin with his wife and his first property, they would go back and forth. Wintertime they lived there, summertime they'd be out there in the forest. He got more work done for the Lord during the wintertime than he ever did during the summer. He got a lot of work done for the Lord. I'm not against off-grid living. You want to live off-grid, that's fine. My warning is be very careful that you don't let it get in the way of your ministry. And I think it is a little bit... And it can, it's not just off-grid living, brother, says Christ. It's anything. You can have a hobby and be a preacher. Okay? But you get into a hobby, some other responsibilities, and those responsibilities can start taking precedent over your main and number one responsibility is you feel you're called into full-time ministry. Be very careful that the cares of this world don't creep in. Well, I, I have three cars I'm responsible for, so now I need to get more money because i got to pay to keep these cars up. And I like to take care of them, so I spend more time taking care of them. That takes away from the ministry. Especially if you have multiple properties, paying taxes on multiple properties, and you have multiple properties you got to take care of. People, uh, if you're in ministry and you say, well, I'm trying to have a part-time job while in ministry, that's okay and that's good and all. But if you ever get called, really called into full-time ministry, oftentimes it's going to come to the whole reason we donate money, brethren, to men in full-time ministry is so they don't have to have a full-time job. Their full-time job is the ministry. And believe it or not, that full-time job is going to be more than the job that they would normally have had. People think, well, it's just a 9-to-5 job, 5 days a week, that's the ministry. No, ministry is a lot more. Ministry is your life. It's going to take up a lot of your time. I have never once said I'm full-time ministry. I don't do all the things that Paul did. I'm not mentoring other brethren. Okay, I'm not getting emails and letters left and right that's taken hours and hours to go through them. I'm not, I don't have brethren to physically fellowship with, but even online I've had fellowships come and go and they fall apart and whatnot. But the whole point is, is I'm not full-time ministry. Okay, I'm a full-time Christian Please, please, don't, I, I see brethren out there mistaken, full-time, being a full-time Christian, and try to grab that and put it in and say that's full-time ministry. No, you're supposed to do that anyway. Why are you adding that claiming it's ministry? Like, if, as if you had a tally card. You don't need one. But it's like if you had a tally card where you have to punch in your card, and it keeps track of all the time you spend in the ministry. You have people that will try to nick, nickel and dime, and they'll throw things in and say, see, this is what I did for the ministry. And it's like, but you're supposed to do that as a Christian anyway, whether you're in full-time ministry or you're just a Christian with your walk with the Lord. You're supposed to do that anyway. Okay, ministry. Paul's the basic example. This is a whole other study. Paul's the biggest example. Mentoring younger men. If you're in full-time ministry, you're going to be mentoring other men in ministry. Okay, you're going to start out as one of those men that's getting ministered, but at some point you get to a point where you are ministering to other men in ministry. Okay, you're going to be fellowshipping with men, brethren, that you get held accountable to. That you're held accountable to. You're going to be preaching the plan of salvation, and you're going to be preaching the word. Those are the three biggest things. You're going to be preaching the word, whether it's the plan of salvation or it's to the body of Christ. Those are the three things. The main things you're going to do when you're in full-time ministry. Whatever your ministry is, uh, wine press or whatnot, you're going to always point people to Jesus Christ. Preaching God's Word. It's always going to be there. Bible version issue. You're going to be putting people towards this God's Word. Okay? Uh, Pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catch away the body of Christ. You're pushing people to look at Jesus Christ, keep their eyes on Jesus Christ, the Word, and you're warning the lost world that we could go home any moment now. Any moment now we could go home and you get left behind. It's never too late at this point. I'm still talking to you even in this video. It's not too late. Get saved. 
a, a pastor points people to this book, it's number one, but they're also mentoring and fellowshipping and being held accountable to the brethren. It, there's a lot to it. It's a lot to be in a ministry full time. So be careful that you don't fall into the cares of this world. Well, I bought this boat, you know, it's falling apart and I'm going to fix it up. And the next thing you know, you find yourself out there for hours and hours and hours fixing this boat up and you haven't done anything for the Lord in ministry. Did you need the boat? No. Oh, I bought me a third vehicle, second vehicle, and it needs to be fixed up and I got to take care of it and everything. And you realize it's taken away from your time in ministry. Did you need a second vehicle? Well, no. Get rid of it. Limit all the responsibilities down to just the necessities so men, you that are in ministry, can focus hardcore on ministry. Be very careful. There's a big push to live off grid. Okay, that's not biblical. Okay, if you want to live off grid, fine. You want to live in the city, fine. Okay, uh, whatever. But be careful that however you're choosing to live, because it's not a sin to live in the city. Okay, it's not a sin to live in the countryside. It's not a sin to live in the wilderness. Remember, there's three different things. City, countryside, wilderness. Okay, it's not a sin to live any one of those ways. But make sure that when you're choosing to live a certain way, don't just jump up and say, God wants me to live this way. Make sure that you're still being able to serve the Lord fully and completely while living that way. If you can't, you might have to live a more simplified life, less stressful life, life with less work in it. But mainly that's why I donate to brethren in ministry. That's why you read how you had sisters in Christ that said, Hey, I want to help those men in ministry. I'll do some of the cooking. I'll do some of the cleaning. I'll help with clothes. This, they take the stress away of those responsibilities. Because right now, I do it all myself. I cook for myself. I clean everything. I do my own clothes. I grow food. Okay, I go hunt and fish. But the thing is, is I do everything. But you had sister in Christ come by and go, Oh, you know what? I'll help you with some of that stuff so you can focus on ministry work. That's a good thing. That's okay. But that's, the, the, that's the warning I'm giving the brethren that when it comes to cares of this world, if you start taking on so many responsibilities, your ministry time just starts shrinking. The time you spend in ministry, the quality of your ministry starts going down. Why? Because you're being distracted by the cares of this world. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. Be very, very careful. 1 Timothy 6.3 says, If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which, he is, which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, Perverse disputing of men of corrupt mind and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. I threw this verse in there because we have the obvious men out there. They're all about money. They want your money. Okay? They don't stand for the absolute truth. But I'm talking about good Bible-believing ministries that over the years, you see them slowly start falling away. Their, their stands aren't as strong. The quality of their studies aren't as thorough as they used to be. What I mean by quality is scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture. Okay? Um, they don't do as much for the Lord as they used to. Well, we used to go out and preach the word. I used to mentor men in ministry. I used to get online and fellowship with the brethren. And I would make videos preaching the word. What do you do now? Well... Everything kind of got cut out. I just don't have time, so I can barely find time to get on and make a couple Bible study videos. What happened? What got in the way that started hurting your ministry? Well, cares of this world is one of the things that can get in the way and start chipping away at your ministry until there's only pieces left. I'm not even doing half. I'm, not, I'm using this as an example. You look at your ministry and go, wait, back then I was doing twice as much stuff for the Lord as I am now. What happened? Cares of this world come creeping in. All right. 
But I read that verse because you have wolf and sheep's clothing and ministry for the money. Anyway, and one of the biggest things they'll say is, look at me, look how blessed I am. I must be doing right because look how blessed I am. Be careful of those people. Okay, and, be, and for those who are saved, be careful not to fall into that trap of doing that. You give God glory for everything. But you don't go, hey, I must be right because look how blessed I am. Well, look at Benny Hinn. Look at some of those other men in the past that they were in it for the money. Look how blessed they are. Look at all the physical wealth that, the, that they have. They must be blessed from the Lord. No, true blessings is look at the men that have been led to Christ. I remember Brother Brian pointing out that somebody was attacking him and he's like, Instead of saying, hopefully, I can't remember if he slipped up and did the wrong thing, but I just remember one time he did the right thing. He said, look at how many men have been saved through this ministry. Have been brought to the Bible version issue, have gotten King James, men and women, sisters in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, that have gotten a King James Bible, that have been blessed by this ministry, by God. That's where the real blessing is. Like I said, I don't want a pat on the back. What I'd like to see is you giving God glory and that... You're learning to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and doing what God wants. Okay? That's what's the blessing of a ministry. Okay? The fruit of a ministry. People's lives are, people are getting saved. God is changing their lives and they're living for Jesus Christ every day with the life they're living. They believe in this book. This is their final authority. They're looking for Jesus Christ to come back any day now. But preaching the plan of salvation that's found in the King James Bible, not these Bible perversions, like I said, they take repentance out completely. You'll never find Jesus Christ, the God's grace. You'll never find God's grace through these Bible perversions. Never. Someone else had to come along and preach repentance that they took out of those Bible perversions. Repentance that's found in the Bible. Sorrow for sinning against God. Godly sorrow. Okay. And we've already touched it a little bit, but I just want to go over it one more time and then we'll wrap it up. It is feminism. Sisters in Christ, be very careful with feminism. 1 Samuel 15, 23 says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as the iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. He's talking to people back then. But the instruction righteous is there. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as the iniquity and idolatry. Stubbornness. I've seen this when it comes to feminism and women. They're very stubborn. Okay? They're rebelling against God and how God said this. And your flesh is always going to be trying to push you and try to get you to rebel against God. Satan's always going to go after the woman first. Okay, that's why you need that head covering. That's why you need that protection. All right? So I put it again. Sisters in Christ, I understand and I pray for you. I pray for the brethren as a whole, but in this subject, I really pray for the sisters in Christ out there. One of the biggest things you're going to struggle with to the day you die is feminism. It is everywhere. Movies, TV shows, video games, jobs, commercials, our uh, government, you get up and you walk into town, it's right in your face. You've been embedded into you that, believe it or not, this is feminism, whether you like it or not. Do you have your own job, your own home, your own car, you're living by yourself, you're your own head covering? That's feminism. But this big push today out there is that you have to get out there and have your own job and your own things, and you got to learn to take care of yourself. You don't need a man. That's feminism. And it's embedded into people and in America. All around the world, but definitely here in America. So when you get saved and say, I'm going to do a, God to this 180, turns me around in the river and tells me to start swimming upstream, one of the biggest things that are going to be bumping into you trying to get you to turn around is feminism. You're your own woman. You can do whatever you want. I've talked to professing women. The one thing that gets me about them is feminism. You talk to them, well, I have my own career, and through my own career, I was able to buy my own place, and I have my own car, and, and everything, and I, I still wear pants because I feel like it, and there's nothing wrong with wearing pants, and, and on and on. What's going on? Feminism. And these women are going to be in your life. You're going to have some family members that are hardcore feminists. 
and they're always going to be pushing you and you're going to have to say, I can't have you in my life. You keep trying to push me down a way I'm not supposed to go and you're tempting me. I can't have you in my life. I just want to say, brothers and sisters in Christ, mainly to the sisters in Christ, I understand the struggle. My encouragement is keep struggling. Keep swimming against the flow. Keep going the direction that God wants you to go. Okay? Find a man that's a head covering. And I pray and I pray that someday, that if it's God's will, you will find a husband for a head covering. But you need to have a head covering and protection. And you need to learn to have that attitude of, I can have a man in authority over me. A lot, of people, a lot of these feminists will say that are professing Christians that Jesus is their head covering, but they don't listen to him whatsoever. Because the Bible says a man is supposed to be a woman's head covering. Jesus is the man's head covering. And God is Jesus' head covering. In other words, Jesus is God fully and completely. Okay, That's just the way it is. One of the things that will screw up your walk with the Lord, sisters in Christ, is feminism. One of the things that's going to screw up if you're married to a saved man, one thing that's going to screw up his walk with the Lord is if you invite feminism into your home. You start letting feminism come back in. It'll destroy your home. Okay? Cares of this world. You're going to have people pushing you and pushing you and pushing you. You were raised on it. It was just embedded into you, as they say. But God can fix you. God can uh, get that sickness and cure you and get it out of your life. But it'll always be a struggle. It'll always be there as a struggle. And I'm praying for you, brother, uh, sisters in Christ. I'm praying for you specifically, sisters in Christ. Okay? Modest apparel, long hair, practicing to be a keeper at home. But that head covering, definitely need to have that head covering. Whether it's a husband or a father or who you can find, pastor. Okay? Ultimately, everything we talked about, brothers and Christ, my whole point is is Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and His perfect written word. Uh, if I can grab it. King James Bible. That is my hope and my desire for this whole study. I know it's been very long. If you've paused it and broke it up into smaller pieces and watched it here and there, my biggest push for you through this all when it comes to the cares of this world, this whole world's going to try to throw anything and everything they can at you to get you to turn your back on looking at Jesus, looking for Jesus Christ. They're going to do everything they can to make it so you're not fruitful. And they're going to make cares of this world. It's just a big thing. We're going to get into the deceitfulness of riches. We're going to get the lust of our things. Remember how sin can come in? You put your Bible down and you're indulging in sin. And next thing you know, you haven't prayed in a while. You haven't read your word, the word of God in a while. Sin can come in and really destroy your life too. But one thing that really catches the brethren by surprise, because we're preaching against sin, we still need to preach more against sin, but what really takes the brethren by surprise is cares of this world. You stop being on guard when it comes to husband and wives, but the Bible warns you, okay, I need to make sure I'm pleasing God first, my husband second. I need to make sure I'm pleasing God first, my wife second. Pleasing God first, my children third. You know, wife second, children third. You know, make sure that God is number one in my life. His word is the foundation of my life, and I'm not getting pulled away by cares of this world. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and his word. He can come back any day now. Get busy working for the Lord and doing what's right. I'll see you in the next video.